And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will talk about cloud-based data warehousing, what's new and what stays the same. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to continue the networking and conversation after the webinar and to learn more about Donna, just go to community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is, currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategies Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. Data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello <laughs> and welcome. Hi, Shannon. It's always a pleasure to join you guys on these webinars, and thanks to everyone for joining probably from home on these days. Um, so to kick off, um, as you know, this is a a monthly webinar, and many of you, we, we love to see the familiar names on, on, the, on the list, have joined us from previous ones. Um, if you have not, and any of those from previous recordings or even from previous years are of interest to you, um, as, as uh, Shannon will mention at the end and in her follow-up, these are all on, re on demand for recording. So you can always catch either this one or previous uh, webinars if you wish. And of course, we would love to have you join any of those others in the list and this monthly a series if any of them are of interest to you. Um, but today, uh, the hot topic is cloud-based data warehousing. Um, and, and what's new? There's a lot new in the industry, but then, you know, what does stay the same? And that may be top of mind to a lot of you who may have been in the industry for a while and are seeing this new technology, you know, come on board, and, and what does that mean? Um, so, you know, what's nice about that is that data warehousing, despite uh, the myth of its demise, it still has a strong place in today's organization. It's not going anywhere anytime I see um, one could say that it's been around for decades, therefore um, it's outdated, or one could say it's been around for decades, therefore it's a very strong foundation that clearly works, right? Um, yet things are changing. So how do things like cloud uh, change the world of data warehousing? How do things like data links, uh, streaming data, all these new technologies work. So what's changed, what stayed the same, and, and what really start to think about as you look at these. Um, so uh, Data Diversity and I, we do a yearly webinar, uh, webinar, I can talk, a uh, yearly survey um, on business uh, data, data management. And these are some of the highlights you'll see from that survey. And what's nice is one of the top, we asked sort of what are your drivers um, for your organization? And some of the key drivers you'll see relate directly to reporting and analytics. So over 80% when they asked what are your drivers for data management in general, could have been anything, could have been operational excellence, could have been the digital business, et cetera, and those did come out the absolute number one um, with the idea of reporting and analytics, which shouldn't be a surprise. 87% of those were using both BI and data warehouse, which is nice to see, and you might think they go together, but unfortunately I still see a lot of clients uh, we, that bring us in and they, they may have a great front end on the BI layer, but may not have a proper sort of data warehouse in, in, in the back. And you can see you know, a lot of these new modern tools can let you do really fancy things from a spreadsheet or from flat files. Uh, but as you probably know, if you're on this call, that's probably not the best way to scale the enterprise. So that was heartening to see that kind of equal measure of data warehousing and BI. Um, data Lake, I know that's been a hot topic for the past few years. Um, we, we sort of asked for a data lake ad adoption and whether people were using it on its own or in conjunction with a warehouse, and, and you'll see that the majority of folks who do have a data lake in this particular survey um, use that in, in conjunction with a warehouse, which is what I like to see, because I think they both have their place and it's not an either or, um, and we will talk about that in this presentation. So, um, as, as I mentioned, so one of the top drivers when we do look at business 
drivers was this idea of gaining insight through reporting and analytics. It does not mean that some of these other things are not important as well. So when we look at saving costs and increasing efficiency or reducing risk, uh, you'll see some of the other big ones there, you know, digital transformation, customer centricity, et cetera. Um, but when we look to move to the cloud and we're looking to do things like saving cost and, and increasing efficiency, that is a very valid driver for folks trying to look at some of this platform scalability. And so I see those as, as sort of joined nicely together. When we look at l reducing risk, um, and we'll show in kind of some surveys coming up, that is a concern um, and there's pros and cons to the cloud, but uh, some folks are still sort of on the fence with that, especially if they have sort of HIPAA protected data or you know, secret type data that they, they're a little nervous about. And, and maybe that's valid and maybe it's not, I will, jury's out on that. But um, uh, those are definitely kind of, uh, I don't wanna say competing, but uh, corollary of, of drivers. Um, so when you look at a lot of talk of cloud, but how much is actually in use? Who's starting to look at it? And, and then in terms of going to the cloud, cloud is just the platform, right? So you could have a relational database on cloud, you could have a, um, a column store database on the cloud, you could have a bunch of flat files. If you think it's kind of an AWS bucket, you could just be storing, you know, streaming data files and dumping them there. So it's sort of a, a lot of folks just sort of say, you know, we have a cloud first or a moving to the cloud, but as we know, there's a lot of nuance to that. So clearly still the, the leading technology out there, especially for data warehousing, where it makes a lot of sense, is this idea of a relational database. Um, but still today, on-prem uh, seems to have a higher ranking. And we've done, as I said, the survey for the past few years, and that has been the case for the past two or three years as we've run the survey, that relational um, is still kind of the, the go-to what people are currently using. But when you look to the future um, and what people are planning to use, you'll see that not only is um, relational still high, which is fine, especially when we're talking about data warehousing, and there are other, are, are other options, and we'll talk about that, um, but you'll see that cloud is definitely sort of edging out over relational, but not by much, right? It isn't necessarily the clear winning horse. Um, so again, there's pros and cons. It doesn't even have to be either or. You can have sort of a hybrid approach of, and this, if you, if you notice in the question, it was select all that apply, right? So you don't have to move everything to the cloud. It could be your sandbox data goes to the cloud or, or et cetera, or it could be different by different subject areas. You don't have to do one size fits all, which again, you've, if you've been on these calls before, you might've heard me talk to this slide in a different perspective, um, but uh, it isn't just relational databases and you're seeing that because there's so much new technology, people are looking at things like graph databases or no, no SQL databases, et cetera. And I think that's great as well, because there is no one size fits all. There's so many different use cases and it's just picking the right tool for the right job. Uh, that said, relational is still a good tool for the job it does, um, but there is plenty of other options out there now. Um, so when we go to specifically, and this is again from that same survey that you can get from Dataversity or, or our website as well, um, what are the pros and cons? And I found this particularly interesting. Um, there, there used to be a, it was one of the big banks and I, I spent a lot, I used to spend a lot of time in airports until this uh, latest trend we have now. Um, but it was sort of like, well, what, what is heaven and what is hell? And that have sort of the same picture, someone staying in a tent, right? And for someone who loves camping, that's heaven. And for someone who hates camping, that's hell. With a cruise ship, right? One spouse thinks that's heaven, one spouse thinks that's hell. And in the same way, Cloud had some of the similar answers. So when they say, when we, the question was, what are your reasons for moving to the cloud? I can talk today. Moving to the cloud. Some folks are there moving to the cloud because it's cost lower cost. And some people were concerned about moving to the cloud because the costs were higher, right? So it sort of depends on your perspective. And that's valid. We'll talk about that. It isn't necessarily always cheaper. It's sort of the decision, do you want to rent or buy a house? It really, there's no one answer. It depends on your, your how you're, you know, are you going to be moving soon? What's your age? What's your income? All of that. Um, the other one that sort of had that same sort of, you know, is it heaven or is it hell? It is that idea of performance. Some folks wanted to move to the cloud because they had better performance. And some people want to move to the cloud or afraid to move to the cloud because they had lower performance. So again, I, I think too, there it might be a bit of a, a misnomer because is it really the cloud that offers the performance or is it how you're architecting on that cloud, right? And we'll talk more about that, that there's, again, the cloud is the platform and it offers a lot of new technologies, but you don't necessarily just get lift and shift into the same things you were doing on-prem and expect to do that in the cloud, um, both for performance uh, because there's new tools in the cloud, also for cost. So uh, I'll talk a little more about this sprinkled throughout the presentation, but 
Um, that is a bit of a, a culture shift for folks that, you know, think of the old days or current days, right? I, I have a SQL server and I spin up the box and, and I sort of do things with it. Um, with, with the cloud, you're sort of being paid, you know, you're charging by usage and performance. And, and, uh, by, and so I had one client uh, sort of by accident, you know, the, the, they sort of opened up usage to the cloud. And, and the beauty of these is that it really is easy to scale up and spin up an instance. And the entire dev team was doing that, sort of forgot to shut them off. Um, was just sort of, you know, thinking of it as a sandbox. They got a, a million U.S. dollar bill a few months later, uh, six months later. And had a massive sticker shot. And, and to be fair, the developer, you know, there was a bad policy to allow that. Developers really hadn't even thought of that, right? So that was definitely somewhere uh, where it was higher cost, not because of the, you know, the way the cloud was architected. It was the way they were they were using it, right? So the ones that did sort of were different were the the second one there. Whether it's uh, better scalability moving to the cloud, I would agree with that. Uh, not only in terms of the ability to start small. I mean, I, I do that myself. Um, one of the beauty of these cloud platforms is that anybody in their pajamas, and that might be several of you, shut up your camera, just kidding, um, is that you can spin up some amazingly complex systems literally from your kitchen table um, on, on some of these platforms. They do AWS and Azure and Google, right? Um, and so you can start small and then grow. Or if you're a small organization and you want to scale. The other thing we see on um, some of our clients is you know, yearly seasonability. Season, huh, today is a great day for my talking. Um, you know, maybe over the holiday season, uh, you have more, you know, web traffic or more sales. So you want to be able to, to scale during the year as well. It isn't necessarily all or nothing. Um, and then the kind of, and the concerns, that idea of losing security and privacy. Um, again, there's SLAs, you know, you can just, you know, some of your, your trust is in, in the vendor you choose. Um, but do remember, you know, we like to talk about the cloud. The cloud is just somebody else's machine. <laughs> it is not this myth mythical thing. And so think of that. Anything you're sending over the cloud is, is sort of could potentially have, have risk there. Uh, so I found that interesting kind of pros and cons that the folks are considering. Um, the other thing to think about is this idea of platform availability and uptime and, and SLAs. And again, with all of this, there is no one-stop shopping answer. So sorry if, <laughs> if you were looking for the easy answer. Nothing's easy in tech. Um, but it's good to think of the pros and cons. You don't also want to overcomplicate it. Um, but think of the, the downside risk, and it's also an upside, um, is that you are no longer owning your own service and you're no longer responsible for the downtime. So any of you who may have been a DBA and had to come in at midnight on a Saturday to get the server back up, maybe that's the best thing you've ever heard, right? Not your problem. Um, but th this tweet um, there from Azure, um, I actually had retweeted this because one of my massive, um, massively large companies in, in Latin America had their entire system running on this Azure um, platform. And it went down and they had some serious operational issues. And so this was top of mind. And which is why it was top of mind in my tweet stream. Um, and yes, there, there's contingencies. They could move to a different area, et cetera. Um, and that doesn't happen that often. Um, but if that would make you nervous, I mean, I'm sometimes the type of person I would rather make my own mistake than have somebody else make a mistake because it's out of your control. Um, the other thing is that some organizations have a multi-cloud platform to reduce risk. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be, and I, I, I don't generally like to use product names, but I think we all sort of know that at least the big three, <laughs> the big four out there. So, um, for example, you could use Azure and AWS for different, different some of your use cases or have backups in one or, or the other. Uh, that is how some people are handling it. The other nice thing about these platforms is that you can do regional scalability. So you could have backups in different regions. You could pick regions um, for performance reasons, you could pick reasons for compliance. So think of GDPR or, or areas where you want to keep your data within a certain geographical region, you can. I mean, you, this is um, a screenshot from Azure and you can see they actually do provide a fair amount of information. I know in my uh, DBA-ish days, I, if I had a, a nice website like this from my DBA, I would have been thrilled. I never saw stuff like <laughs> well, I, you know, I was being a user, I wasn't the DBA. Um, so they do have, you know, they're fairly open with a lot of the information, and that's a, a pro as well. Um, the other thing, and when one thinks about it, you can think, of, is, there, is there risk or can they handle it? And this was a quote just a couple months ago from one of my clients, um, an auto manufacturing company, and we were sort of thinking of the cloud versus not cloud, and he was that kind of matter-of-fact, blunt kind of guy. And he said, 
you know, if Amazon and Google or Microsoft can't handle it, you think we're going to handle it better? Seriously, like we, we build cars. We don't build software. And that is one of the ideas of the cloud. Outsource things you're not experts in. So you are, you know, insert your industry here. You're an education organization. You're a nonprofit. You're a bank. You're a retail company. Very few of you on the call are probably software companies, I'm sure. Some of you are. We always have a few. Um, so do you want to be in the business of maintaining your servers? The answer very well may be yes, right? I used to work in a top secret facility where absolutely we had our servers in the room that nobody else could go in and all of that, right? Um, but if you're not that and you just want to scale up a data lake to do some testing, by, by all means use this and, and there's everything in between. So I, I thought this was a decent slide to kind of look at some of the different aspects of this idea of platform availability, definitely positives. There's definitely some risk as well. Um, and there's certain ways to mitigate that risk, like things like multi-platform, uh, the mix of some on-prem and some in the cloud. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, so when we look at some of the benefits to moving to more of a cloud based data warehouse. One of them is the one I touched on is the ease of entry. Um, so, you know, in, in the on-prem world, you literally have to buy your server. You need to have to have it set up. You either have to wait for somebody to do that and give you access or learn how to do that yourself. And that is a, is a realistic daunting task. It's, a, it's also a cost. Um, so again, you can sit in your kitchen by your kitchen table and, and spin up an AWS instance very quickly. Obviously, the cost, um, but that is, but there's also a learning curve. So, is, again, you may know on prem and not, um, not cloud as much, but there, a lot of those skills do transfer. Also, when we look at the increased focus on analytics, so the topic of this is data warehouse. When we think of data warehouse, well, a lot of us think of kind of the traditional, I'm doing my financial reporting or my sales reporting. I want to know sales by region, by sales rep, by product, by all of that, and, and often that is in structured relational type databases. But more and more, because of these cloud platforms to a great extent, there, there's just the availability of so much more data and non-structured data, or even the products themselves. You know, think of if your product is Fitbit, you could exactly know how people are using your product and when and what customer sentiment is, et cetera. Um, and you probably can't store that very easily on your SQL Server instance on-prem, right? You probably want something with, with greater scalability. And you want them to be able to mix together. It isn't either or. I want to know sales by region, and I want to know usage uh, by my customers in there and what the sentiment is, and, and are they tweeting about my product? And so th that sort of starts to meld. And so as more people are moving away from just, I don't want to say just because it's still super important, uh, but more your traditional descriptive analytics um, into more prescriptive and, and, and you know, um, predictive models and things, you do want that flexibility of having kind of uh, scalability, uh, which leads to that third one, which is similar, um, that uh, volume and velocity of variety of data, uh, not only more data or the ability to get more data, but variety of data it could be sensor streaming data. It could be voice analytics. And, and so many of the customers I work with that, you know, you might not even think of that company as someone who might need big data, but even something like support call logs. Can you, can you stream that text of, of the support calls and, and do some voice uh, analytics on that? Um, and then cost savings, often that is why folks go to the cloud. Um, it could be that the fact that it's low cost of entry, but then there's that ability to scale, um, you know, similar to, you know, I'm going to uh, sell you a car and it's only $9.99 a day, um, but you're going to be paying that $9.99 for the rest of your life. That's probably going to be <laughs> more expensive over time rather than just buying it up front. Um, so that's kind of that idea of your OPEX versus CAPEX. And sometimes, and that's something to check with finance. Some companies want one or the other, and that helps make that decision. Um, and then I already mentioned that flex usage. So think of your seasonal variability. Maybe it isn't something you use all the time, um, and you want to have that flexibility. Um, and I mentioned that already, that cloud does not always mean lower costs. Consider your usage patterns and, patterns and your practices before making that jump. And I've already mentioned as well that democratization of data, but that is a way um, that these are growing is that it really is easy to quote, spin up some of these new instances. You don't necessarily have to be a platform expert, but we'll talk later, that's also the downside, right? <laughs> um, so I told this story too many times, but you know, I, when I bought my house, it was a bit of a fixer upper and I had grand visions of doing everything myself. Um, and after spending a weekend uh, trying to put up a wall and I had a, the contractor come in and he literally did it in an hour when I was on a conference call, I realized that was not my strength. And yes, it was easy to go buy the, the lumber from Home Depot. It wasn't, I did not necessarily have the skills 
<laughs> so same thing with data, right? There's certain best practices that we know as data management professionals uh, that make that make it more effective. So uh, easy to be an easy expert, but you can also get yourself into trouble. And that can also lead into uh, some of these cost savings um, is that when the data warehouse is, is performance and tuned pro properly to be in the cloud, yes, it can be cost savings, but we've, We've seen some of our clients, again, seems easy. I can spin it up and put data in, but are you maximizing the way that data is being optimized or are you really doing expensive things and it's fast enough? Do I, do I need to really model the data like I used to? It still works. Yeah, but you're spending a lot. Maybe you're wasting cycles. And yeah, it works, but there's probably a still a better way. Um, so um, I, I, I touched on this as well, is that you know in, in the day, or was there ever a day, when we only wanted to do descriptive analytics, I sold uh, this much product last month. Tends to be sort of hindsight, um, tends to be more descriptive. And just to give credit where credit's due, this is the Gartner's um, kind of graph on this of kind of the evolution of analytics. As the, you sort of get past that descriptive, you might want to say, okay, sales dropped last month, but then why? Why did it happen? What are my diagnostic analytics? And then even better, well, what's going to happen next month? Will they drop again? So how do I look into more predictive analytics? And then prescriptive, how can I make that happen? I know that a lot of my company, companies I'm working with are really looking at that in terms of just think of next be best action. So you can take things that looked in the past and said, I know that based on these three points that the customer might break, bring up, I should do X. Or um, you know, if, if the uh, manufacturing uh, Client does this, I should do why, you know, and just kind of really understanding based on past history what you should do next, and that really gets into the the uh, benefit of some of your analytics. Um, but in order to do that, you do need some of those volumes and history and variety, and that's where a lot of folks are looking to the more that data lake style implementation, where you can get that volume and variety of data to really do that type of analytics. Um, so. <laughs> myself over this picture. I thought it was cute. Um, so when you think of the data warehouse versus the data lake, um, here's the same guy, different clothes. In a way, when you think of the traditional data lake, it is a bit more casual, right? You can do more exploration. A lot of folks use things like sandbox analytics. Not that you can't have um, data lakes in production, but it tends to have been a looser environment, partly because you can spin these things up easily. And I've seen clients where sort of IT and sales didn't get along or sales and marketing didn't get along and marketing went and bought their own lake and did it themselves. They were, you know, techy enough to be able to do that. Um, so it is sort of a loser way of working, kind of that more exploratory Silicon Valley startup kind of attitude. When you think of the traditional data warehouse, it is more structured and, and it tends to be more the guy in the suit for financial reporting. And, and yes, it does take a bit longer because I have to know that if I'm reporting to the street, our sales last quarter, they have to be right. And I have to have the lineage for that. So it's not necessarily um, that the one is better than the other, but they are very different things. So you'll see that's kind of the or condition there, right? You either have a data lake and it has its pros and cons uh, for that kind of sandbox analytics. And then you have your traditional data warehouse, which is you know, more strict and more formal for things like financial reporting. But in the new world, as we go to some of these data platforms, wait for it. It can be best of both worlds. I was very excited to find these pictures. Um, where it's more of your XOR um, condition, right? So that it's the, the mullet, you sort of you know, formal up front and shorten, I got it backwards, you know, shorten the back. Um, so as we get to these, these cloud worlds, um, that, that merging of what's the data lake and what's the data warehouse and what's the staging area and what's the lake and does it have to be just relational or kind of, kind of mixed methods? Um, it is is really where some of these platforms are heading, which is pretty exciting. And that's, I call that more of an integrated data science platform where yes, it's the best of both worlds in some ways, if you know how to optimize them, um, is that you can do your traditional and you know, more relational style of data warehousing, but you also have the scalability and the flexibility to have different kind of data sets. So um, both the suit and the genes uh, together. Um, because and and I I I from the beginning was not I'm 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 you know, sitting on my porch saying get off my lawn with this one because I was old fashioned before it was hip of when data lace came out and I think there was a lot of vendor hype of we don't need data warehouses anymore you just kind of put stuff in this place and 
magic happens, right? And I think a lot of us who knew that technology were a bit skeptical of that. And again, not that data links are bad things. It was the it's all or nothing, you know, it's the fact that these are the new nirvana. Um, so I think for that, there's some disillusionment. So you'll see here again, quoting Gartner, uh, they have their hype, hype cycle for different technologies and, and data lakes are a bit of trough of disillusionment, but I think they're the first to say, often this disillusionment happens because things were overhyped. It doesn't mean if you look at some of the things um, that are kind of in that plateau of productivity, data quality tools are fine things, right? Um, it's just that probably in the day, those were hyped as well. So again, doesn't mean data lakes are bad things. I think it's coming back into reality. I, I, you'll see that sort of the trough of disillusionment is some of the Hadoop distributions. Uh, and I'm seeing that as well. I think a lot of folks are um, when they think of sort of big data, it is more definitely not an on-prem type solution, but maybe also kind of some of these cloud solutions that are less Hadoop focused um, and kind of are some other solutions out there. So found that interesting. I uh, had my, I told you so, sunny moment because uh, I can sometimes be a curmudgeon, but when I am a curmudgeon, I tend to be right. I pick my curmudgeonness carefully. Um, so I think this is a more realistic approach of the, and if you remember back to the survey in the beginning of how are people using data lakes and data warehouses, that um, if you think of the green on the left, right, gosh, I'm having a day, um, that the data warehouse is more of your enterprise system of rec record and or data marts, and we can argue the difference or similarities there. Um, also things like your master and reference data, where yes, by design, they are modeled, uh, they are structured, and they are validated. And you want them to be, again, right? You're, you're reporting your financials to the street. You want them to be right. I want a single master view of all the physicians who are certified to do surgery in my hospital. Yes, I think I want that to be accurate and mastered and correct. Um, and then the data leg is more of your discovery and sandbox, um, which tends to be data exploration or, or lightly model data. Um, but again, especially as we move forward in some of these platforms I'll talk about, it doesn't have to be, and I know, um, you know, early on, uh, as, as folks were starting to move the concept of like into more production level things, you know, I, I we often think of oh, it's a sandbox, but think of I'm a manufacturing plant. I'm doing Internet of Things streaming sensor data from my from my manufacturing machinery. That's not sandbox. That's my business. I'm running off that. So if the sensors say something's down. I need to make that next best action business decision off it. So I don't want to overstate that, you know, it's sandboxy, but often the driver has been around analytics. Um, but regardless of whether it's a lake or uh, the enterprise system of record, you still have security and privacy, and you still should have governance and collaboration, and you should be able to report across all of those. But historically, those have been kind of separate environments. Um, and we'll talk later about governance and how that might be different on each environment, but you still need it as was security and privacy. And, and that's a trend. You know, often I'll have a customer ask things like, well, would you see document management the same as data management? And should that be part of the governance council? And I, I usually have a snarky answer with something like, well, if someone steals your credit card information and then later you go to your credit card company and they say, well, it was in a PDF, it wasn't in a database, <laughs> you still stole my credit card. Um, that's sort of the great example of, yeah, it's, it's the type of data, not necessarily the format of it. Um, and security and the governance to go across all. Um, and, and when I bring up negative clients examples, I generally uh, anonymize to protect the innocent, but I'll use this person's first name. I remember the massive uh, financial institution in the New York area, and it was a younger person. They were talking about their PII policy or their you know, personally identifiable information or PCI with their financial. And, and very earnestly, he was a younger, younger gentleman. And he raises his hand. He's like, "So I shouldn't have been putting the credit card fee zone on that exploratory data lake." And the boss very quickly said, "Pretty people talk to to work." Um, and he literally didn't know that you really shouldn't have just been taking live PCI data and throwing it out in the lake to kind of do some analytics on. Um, and he quickly found out. Um, but that's really, again a risk of, especially as these things become easier to spin up. You want to make sure that all of these kind of citizen data scientists have the same. Um, idea of the data governance and security as is needed. Um, so, but as we go into this more modern data warehouse, uh, I think the opportunities are exciting, and this is where the, the half genes, half business suits sort of come in. And and before I go into these examples, uh, look at the lower left. I want to just completely caveat: these are just examples. 
and data warehouses can be done in different ways. There's pros and cons to each, as is with the cloud. But these are just two examples of, of some semi-popular ways of doing it, but I think they're indicative of the story we're going to tell. So in the traditional data warehouse, you're probably familiar with this type of model. Again, there's some different flavors. But you have your source system, and you generally, I hope, have a data model for that, and hopefully a glossary to understand what that data means. You probably want to stage that into some sort of landing area or staging area, whatever you're going to call that. Um, probably in its source form, uh, you probably want some model of that. And then at some point within the warehouse, and whether it's in the nerd Kimball or however you want to do that, you have a model for it. Uh, you generally do some sort of ETL because how you want the or extract, transform, and load. So because how you it lives in the source is probably not how you want it in the warehouse. Again, you want to start to massage that and normalize it or star scheme it or whatever, so you can start to slice and dice it for your business needs. Again, you'll have models there, whether they're relational or dimensional. You'll want things like business glossaries. Often there's some sort of idea of a cube that can not only help you slice and dice easily, uh, but also kind of have that business semantic layer. So what does TBL underscore CT mean? Oh, maybe that's the count of you know, tables or, or whatever, but it puts kind of a business layer onto that. You can also get some of your definitions there. And then the idea of kind of the reporting and the dashboards on top of that with maybe in a um, BI tool, for example. If you look at kind of the cloud data warehouse, um, there's just more options. You can still do what we described above. It's still, it's still a very valid model. I have several customers doing that now and it works and it's great. Um, but there's also more options that can kind of blend those two. So not only when, if you look up top, those data sources were all sort of relationally, <laughs> um, relational databases. With these new data sources, maybe I want my video files or, or I, I want my sensor data or I want my video, my audio chat logs, et cetera. You can kind of put that in the landing zone, which is kind of like your staging area in a way, um, but it can have a mix of kind of that lake and the structure tables, um, and that can exist in its raw form. Um, you can move that then to a staging area. Maybe you start to put that in third normal form. Maybe you want to warehouse it there. Um, Example here, I saw someone cheering. We don't talk about that a lot on these webinars. Data Vault um, is a way where you can kind of store the data in a way that's flexible enough that you don't have to necessarily put it in the warehouse. So, again, the benefit of the warehouse is I want to exactly know what I'm going to report on, how I'm going to report on it, and make it consistent. That's a strength, but it's also a limitation. The idea of the Data Vault is you model it in a way. Um, that is structured and you have some business layer on it, but it's flexible and you're kind of keeping in its format because you don't necessarily know. So it's in a bit of kind of a best of both worlds approach if, if you're a fan of data vault. And then in this example, um, you can kind of take the data Mars star scheme of them as well. And then the data consumers are often more broad as well. Maybe it's not that you, again, you can't necessarily not do that in the data warehouse. Uh, but maybe it's an API, maybe it's a more analytical, uh, maybe it's R or Python on the front end, and or maybe it's your uh, Power BI or Tableau or MicroStrategy or whatever you're using on the front end. This has been referenced from Click, um, so that was, I, I am referencing their model at the bottom. Um, and then you'll notice in the bottom, um, and again, often when we think of a glossary or the old um, you know metadata repository or data dictionary it tends to be sort of source specific here's my data dictionary for the warehouse this idea of these data catalogs um, can be a bit more broad uh, they can have lineage across different sources uh, they're a little more user friendly you can kind of do that search and governance and kind of a bit of search and discovery for your data assets kind of mixed with metadata about what those mean so again it's sort of, if you remember, the, the goofy guy in the half suit, half jeans. That's sort of where we're headed with these modern data warehouses, where it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of the either or, where you've got your leg in one place and you've got your you know, warehouse in another, um, either platform-wise or just design-wise. You can start to sort of merge and morph the two, which is pretty exciting, or, or, or just pretty boring and banal when you think about it. I mean, so, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're taking stuff, we're dumping it somewhere, and we're massaging it, um, and then doing stuff with it. I mean, we want to oversimplify our very complex jobs. Uh, the other thing there that was sort of highlighted, but not maybe enough was the, and I've, and I've seen very intelligent people, otherwise very nice people, get into arguments about, is it ETL or ELT? Is it extract, transform, and load, which is more of your traditional data warehouse? 
or is it you, you kind of extract it, you load it into this more active landing zone, and then when you want to know how to use it, you uh, can transform it and use it in its you know, either Danmart or column database or however you want to use it for your or flatten it out for some analytics. Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the same thing, right? You're dumping it somewhere. You're dumping it before. You're dumping it after. Is it a flexible dump? Is it <laughs> when you know? Is it, so, but it's the same sort of pieces. It's just how you put them together. And maybe I'm oversimplifying because I know this complexity. But sometimes it is help for just kind of step back from some of these heated conversations and being, you know, a little bit more uh, just abstract about these things that can get complex very quickly. Um, so I mentioned this before. Um, and this idea of the democratization of data warehousing. So there's Joe on his left. Joe, do you want to set up your camera? We can see you. I'm just kidding. Uh, but that might be you right now, right? Sitting at your kitchen table. And that's the beauty of these new systems is that you could, from your kitchen table, download NASA data and, uh, you know, do your own analytics. The, the, the power of some of these laptops, a friend of mine, actually, his dad did work for NASA. Um, and he said, you know, he's an older guy now. He's saying, man, the, the power you guys even have on your laptops today is so much more than we had in our systems. And now it's beyond your laptop, right? You have all the power of these cloud platforms. And you might wonder about that picture up top. So if it had any or either now or in the day, before you had to start up a system, you sort of had to go through the DBA. They may be offending some DBA in the call, or they might be like, yep, that's it. I own the keys to the castle, and I've got a dragon. You are not going to get on my system. Because, you know, to be fair to them, um, it may be the enterprise data warehouse, and you don't want Joe in his pajamas all of a sudden just logging into the data warehouse and starting to change some figures. Oh, I wonder what it would be like if we gave Mary a raise. Uh, see if anyone would notice. You, you don't want that sort of thing. Um, a story I probably shouldn't tell. I have a friend who's a quote data warehouse expert, and he actually that kind of looked like my kitchen table, and he was really proud of a system he built for a healthcare company that will remain unnamed. He logged in from my kitchen table and decided, I just want to show you what I did, but I'm just going to go into prod. And I know this guy just had surgery, but I'll delete it after. And he went into a live patient record and changed some of the data to show me how his his different data warehouse was going to, his report was going to show differently. And I just gasped and almost fainted, uh, talking about a HIPAA violation. He literally had to a source medical system and change someone's medical record that he then was going to delete later. So that is not what you want, which is why you have the database administrator with the dragon behind him um, and data governance to do that. So again, it's not really a, a bad thing. But now Jonah's pajamas can go very easily onto things like Amazon's and Web Services, Google Cloud, Azure, et cetera, spin up a, a platform and do some amazing things um, by downloading some of these open data sets or, or you know, uploading your own system. So that is a very exciting part of cloud, um, but it's also a risk and we want to manage that accordingly. Um, and uh, the fundamentals still apply. So I guess we should have mentioned that before with the analogy of me trying to build my own wall in my house until my contractor friend said, did you know that's a load bearing wall? That's a good point. I might have wanted to thought about think about that. And had I built more than one house, as he did, <laughs> I might have thought of that. Um, so same thing with, with database design. There are core best practices um, that those of us who have been in business for a while have sort of learned from. But again, it doesn't mean that everything has to be a star schema or a relational database. Um, th there's no one size fits all. Just do it mindfully. So balance your use cases for what you need for performance, scalability, usability, et cetera. And of course, it would not be a Donna Burbank webinar if we didn't use the word metadata um, because that is critical to anything. Um, you need to understand the context, the traceability, and the meaning of the data. And that is part of the risk of spinning up data. You can load things. And um, oh, the number of clients that's happened to someone, you know, did an analysis and they said, well, that's not what I meant by that data source that you used. So therefore, the analysis is wrong, right? You really need to understand the lineage, the context and the usage of that. Uh, data quality, of course. Um, so plenty of statistics on you know, the disillusionment of a lot of data scientists who get a great degree and have are super smart people to be able to do this analytics and their first data science job, 90% of the time is just cleaning up the data, you know, with, with you know, is M male or is M, you know, market or is M whatever, you know, some very boring and banal things. Uh, so the better you, more you have this great data quality with things like master data, for example, it actually makes a more modern data analytics easier. 
So again, one could do the either or thing, which I'm not a fan of, and say, oh, we don't need things like master data. We're doing big data analytics now. It's an and, right? If you're doing big data analytics on customer sentiment, you absolutely want a good solid list of customer master data. And to get that, you need things like uh, data governance. So, um, you know, as usage increases and more folks have their eyes on this data, you do need more data governance and accountability for that. So, moving ahead, um, this was a TWI report um, that they were kind of saying, you know, what, what, how do we get faster insights from this faster data? And similar, just to kind of back up that case, it's not just me saying it, um, when it looks at some of these impediments from really getting value from some of these new systems, number one was data quality issues. Because, I mean, the, the good news of that, and, and some of the folks in the call might be saying, you know, how do we get visibility for data quality with the business? Sometimes the best way is to do a report and let folks see it. Right? They probably don't see that the data is bad. So spin up the report they want, and then maybe they can see some of the data quality issues. But that will long-term be a hindrance for getting the value you wish. Uh, data silos, some of that can be, you know, remediated by things like a data warehouse. Um, and then governance and regulation is huge, right? We cannot get any value out of the data if we don't know what it means, who's responsible for it, what the lineage is, et cetera. And then data transformation, that's your classic, is it ETL, ELT, whatever. But at some point, um, you have to have some understanding of the lineage of that data, and do we need to kind of transform it to be consistent, or do we want to keep it in this raw form? Again, not always a, a one answer for that. Um, and back to the governance, and, and this is um, <clears throat> a slide I use a lot, but it's it clarified a lot of conflict in organizations of just enough data governance based on the platform. It is absolutely not an all or nothing. And kind of a good guideline to use is the more data shared and used either across the organization or within or beyond the organization, the more formal it needs to be. So one of our clients did a lot of open data publication. There were a government agency, they published scientific uh, statistics, so they absolutely wanted that right. And so they had very strict governance. It was reviewed by several scientists before it was published, that sort of thing. Or think of, as I mentioned, it's, it's your physician master data or your customer or your patients. You absolutely want that right, and you want very strict governance around that. Very different from the bottom, which is maybe just exploratory. I don't know. What are people saying about our products? We want to just do some social media sentiment analysis. Let's see. Um, you don't want to over-regulate that because then there won't be any innovation. So you don't want to kill innovation for the just for the sake of having extra governance, but you don't want to under-govern it either. Back to that PCI example um, where someone who's putting you know customer information out on an unsecured cloud platform. Um, and then it's sort of kind of uh, there's layers between that. So core enterprise data, which is kind of that one step below, you know, if you think of master data or even reference data as your golden record, those are the jewels. They must absolutely be well governed, well managed. Your core enterprise data may be things like your your data warehouse, your enterprise data warehouse, where that's still pretty important. I, I can't have bad numbers to the street, right? And then one level down, uh, would be, you could call these different things, your functional or operational data. Maybe that's a mart for a particular area. Um, maybe it's a relational database that needs to be good enough to kind of see my, I don't know, my performance for my servers or something, but it, it's not mission critical in terms of, um, you know, being looked at by the board or something like that. And then your exploratory data, as I mentioned, that might be your sandbox. I don't know the answer. The data doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just looking for trends. Um, and the other important thing to remember is to create a operational life cycle for this. How, and we're actually we're doing this right now, the company that has, um, they call it their futures innovation team. And the entire job of that team is to find cool stuff and, and start to, you know, do some sample dashboards and analytics. Once they find one of those nuggets, we're putting in that process to how do you move that pr to production and publish it. So great idea. Now we want to make sure there's data quality and there's governance. And we're putting in that operational process, which is what this is trying to describe. Either it could be an entire model that, yep, we did a test. We want to make that model, uh, analytical model into production, make sure the data is right. Or it could just be something simple like a field that maybe that field isn't in the warehouse. But when we did our, our analytics, we found that weather is a predictive indicator. So can we put the temperature of day when people bought that product in our warehouse? Maybe that's important or whatever. But there has to be that life cycle from discovery 
um, when there is something cool that we can make that production. And then of course, where there is production quality data like master data, I pretty much guarantee that your data science group would want nice clean data. So make sure you have both in your ecosystem. Um, so as we talked about design, that you know, there's these great new platforms that can be speed lightning fast, they can scale. Um, in, the, in the spirit of curmudgeonry, you know, a lot of folks say the star schema, you don't need to do that anymore. The platforms are so much faster, you don't need a star schema. So is the poor star schema dead? He looks awfully sad there. Um, I would venture to say no. And I think that, you know, we saw plenty of examples and it has its place, it isn't the only place. Um, but again, performance is one reason, um, but it's also just a nice way for usability to kind of slice and dice the data. So as you know, um, when you design a database, part of it's for performance, part of it's for usability and readability. So, you know, a column store database can be very fast, but if you're trying to query that later for analytics, pretty hard. You know, it isn't your just select name from table um, because it's, it's just not labeled that way, but that, that's really not its purpose. Um, so again, think of that. I'm star schema, I see it all the time. We use it all the time and it isn't the only solution, of course, um, but it doesn't mean it's going away in case anyone thought that on this call. Um, and, and so which leads to this, this idea of there is not one design, but please do think of it as in terms of, uh, these are design patterns, right? Just like you might have a pattern for a suit or a dress. It doesn't mean that people can only wear this one dress. It's, you know, you pick the right pattern for the right occasion. Um, so as long as I've been in the industry, there is still the battle of is it an Inman or a Kimball data warehouse? And there's pros and cons to each, or it's a Kinman or a Imbel, or you know, people sort of mix them together. Uh, but it does seem that people like to have their article uh, arguments. Um, and there's, there's pros and cons um, to kind of having the third normal form type approach. You gotta have your enterprise, um, you know, normalized database. And there's also definitely a place for kind of your star schema slicing and dicing, and they can be combined. Uh, Data Vault, we kind of mentioned they have, the, I'm not going to, each one of these could be a whole webinar, um, but just to give some ideas of things folks are using on some of these platforms. Data Vault, as, as we mentioned, it sort of is a, a type of modeling that you keep things enough in its raw form that's modeled in a way that's flexible so that if, if you, you know, the, again, the pros and cons of a data warehouse, it is rigid by design, but then it's rigid. So if your business rules change, you need to change the warehouse. And you might say, of course, because the business rules change, right? But the data fault kind of flips that a little bit if I don't know what the business rules are. So let's, let's just store the data in a way that's not just willy-nilly like a warehouse, but modeled in a way that I can be more flexible down the road. Uh, columnar, columnar, how do you say that? Um, that, again, is great for speed. I might just, again, if you're not familiar with it, think of instead of doing your, you're focusing on the rows of I have a table in your spreadsheet type way, you flip it and you're really focused on the columns. Let's look at one row of that and, and that uh, can be a very fast way um, to, do, to do analysis or, or web pages and things like that. Not always great to query, um, but again, it has its place. Um, the more you work with the data science team, they want to flatten everything, right? <laughs> because that's the easiest way to do some of these analytical models or denormalize everything. And again, nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that for that particular use case. Probably not the best way to store your warehouse in one big flat table. Um, but again, I, I've seen grown adults argue about these things and it's not that either one was right. They weren't seeing their, their point of view. Um, and more, uh, dot, dot, dot. I mean, there's so many different ways and a lot of these um, uh, data warehouse platforms and cloud platforms have a, a variety of solutions. And, and I, again, it's so easy, probably because the, the industry changes so fast. You just do hear crazy things. I've heard they don't have relational databases in the cloud or, um, you, you know, everything is no SQL or and the, most of these vendors that I mentioned have a, a, a quiver of tools that have a lot of these different types of modeling patterns that are supported. So do take advantage of that. And that's a nice thing too, or graph might be another one. I mean, I could go all day on the different types, um, but we don't have that time. Um, and so that's also a nice way to test some of these technologies because you can kind of spin up. You don't necessarily go have to buy a massive platform. It's kind of learn a bit. And a lot of these vendors um, do have really good education um, about their platform, but kind of more um, just general as well. Uh, so I recommend it is a great place to learn some of these technologies. 
So um, in summary, uh, reporting and analytics we continue, no surprise, tend to be a big business driver as more and more companies want to be data-driven. Uh, Cloud-based technologies have a myriad new opportunities for things like scalability, performance, ease of cost, flexibility, um, which you can take advantage of. I think for me, I mean, there's a lot of things that one can take away from the new data warehousing and data, data cloud-based platforms. I'm kind of excited about this idea of that data lake and data warehouse kind of merging into, uh, yes, there's a place to store a um, variety of data sources and there's a variety of ways to model those and let's keep them close together and not necessarily create more silos and tech that don't need to be. Um, we kind of use them for the best of worlds. Um, that does lead to more citizen data scientists, um, but just like me trying to break down a little bearing wall in my living room, you've got to be careful what you're doing. So the core fundamentals still apply. So if you are someone that's new to cloud data warehousing, don't be afraid to go read. I, I, I just reread myself the old um, Kimball data warehousing book. There's some good things in there. Um, don't be afraid of the fundamentals because they still apply. Um, but there's also a new things. If you're someone who's been in the industry for a long time and kind of learned with Kimball and Inman, go take a look at some of these cloud platforms and some of these new technologies, no SQL, um, it's just one, right? So um, exciting time to link these together. And no matter which one you pick, you can't skip the governance or the quality um, because that's that really what makes your data sing. So um, just before we open it up to questions, uh, those graphs I sent, all the ones that were from our paper at Dataversity, uh, can be found out on dataversity.net, also in globaldatastrategy.com. And Sharon generally puts links to all of this in the follow-up email that you will get shortly. Um, and please do, um, if you're available on April, April 26th, we'll talk about master data management um, and how that kind of can be aligned with your, your governance and your process as well as your data. So, um, Without further ado, just oh, if you want help, we do this for a living. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, Sharon, Shannon, we can open it up for questions. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the recording and links to the slides. Um, and if you have questions for Donna, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen there. I've seen some chats going on, so I'll give you a little time to um, enter that in. So, Donna, um, doesn't regulation like CCPA and GDPR require governance um, all the way down through the exploratory data? Yes, and so that was the point I made earlier of you want a governance layer across all of your layers. So, and that was the poor Pradeep that I keep bringing up that had put PCI out on the exploratory cloud and, and got into quite a bit of trouble. Or the example I gave of, you know, if someone steals your credit card and they say, oh, it's okay, it was just a PDF on AWS, you still, you, you care. So there's certain things that are non-negotiable in terms of CERC security and lineage. Um, but I would say in terms of governance of what does this field mean, in certain ways, you do want to let your exploratory platform be exploratory. And I would say that things like master data have more governance just by the nature of their nature of the beast. You know, you're trying to get a single golden record of all of your physicians doing surgery in your hospital you absolutely need to be right. I'm trying to do sentiment analysis on what my customers think about the new flavor we launched last week. Probably doesn't need to be governed as heavily. But yes, I still, in either case, can't send out patient information or client personal details. That is true. It does cover. But what I was trying to say is that uh, beyond that, there's nuance. You don't want to over-govern the poor people trying to do exploratory stuff. That makes sense. And do you have any comments or on automation for speed for enterprise data warehouse build out? Automation for speed. Um, well, I think there's, a, I mean, definitely um, you should be using in terms of, you know, some of the loading tools are can be, you know, all that should be automated in terms of your ELT or ETL. I mean, nothing should be manual anymore and kind of getting those processes in place for the automation. Um, trying to make sure that load is as fast as possible with kind of change data capture and, and kind of being smart about that. A lot of the uh, performance and tuning can be sort of automated through reports to your, your error checking. I mean, most everything in that platform, I would say, should be automated with the exception of things that need a human, like your design, like your modeling. And I think the more you can spend time on automating the, the stuff that is repeatable, um, you can spend more time on people looking at things that need to be looked at, like your design and what things mean. 
even that said, though, even some of the metadata tools, stuff that we used to have to do by hand, that, you know, some of the abbreviations and what they mean, there's some neat AI tools that can kind of do an augmented learning for some of the stuff that even though a human needs to look at, it can kind of be augmented. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your, answered your question, but hopefully I did in terms of, yeah, most, most things now that we ever had to do by hand or a human could by hand, if you think it's getting repetitive, look for a tool that can automate it because this probably exists. And Donna, how you govern catalog uh, managed metadata across on-prem and cloud, especially when cloud is often outside normal IT project governance? Um, I have a slide on that in another presentation. Um, yeah, I think I think you also have to think not it's not only a, a point of a cloud versus on-prem, but it's kind of usage back to that. If you think that pyramid of to start with, what's the use of your catalog? Is it that this is the documented definition that you might have heard me on previous one talk about encyclopedia versus Wikipedia? Is this the standard published definition that is published all and, and, and should not be modified without a governance to check it? Or is it, you know, there's some tools that are more collaboration tools uh, that kind of allow back and forth. And, and most of these platforms can kind of see both on the cloud or on-prem. When you start to get kind of off or be in between companies, there's this idea of kind of metadata registries um, and there's cloud um, sort of web-based uh, models. Uh, a lot of folks that publish open data, I'm seeing more and more they have a nice metadata set. And we're working with a couple companies now that they're trying to, do, if you think doing a data model that hard in between within a company, trying to have some industry standards across organizations helps as well. Because if you're going to be sharing data across, there's probably a governance org between organizations as well. The governance doesn't always in with your own company. So that was kind of a laundry list of things, but hopefully one of those hit the mark. <laughs> Indeed. And so, Don, why, why is security and privacy at the bottom? It should also be at the um, security and privacy layer as well, right? Um... Did you say that again? The security light was at the bottom? Yeah. Why is security and privacy at the bottom? Security privacy at the bottom doesn't mean that it's last. I think that was a graphical to that was sort of the foundation um, so that goes across. I guess we put it, could have put it at the top or along the side. Um, but it, I like to put, I generally in my architecture diagrams put it at the bottom along with governance because to me that's the foundation on which everything is built if you look at it that way. Um, and then I tend to put either left to right or top to bottom, things like reporting and the user facing stuff, either up top or on the right and kind of go that way. But yeah, just kind of a design thing. Doesn't mean it's the bottom, it's the bottom in terms of last, I would say it's the foundation. And I think we've got, we've got a few minutes left. I'm gonna try and slip in a couple extra questions here. Um, how do cloud data warehouses alleviate the need for OLAP cubes? Why do they alleviate the need for OLAP cubes? Well, um, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, some of the performance can be faster um, with some of these than that, but I think that can also be a misconception um, because I think there's several reasons for OLAP. I mean, one is the ability to have a faster performance, but the other is some of the usability um, in terms of, I, I just find it really intuitive to kind of have that cube model because it's kind of that slicing and dicing or a Excel pivot table that a lot of people can relate to. Um, so in that sense, I think some of those paradigms don't go away. Um, but there's also other ways to do that. Having a good data catalog can sort of, you know, a lot of those kind of cubes have a nice semantic layer with what the terms mean or kind of have a business layer. Some of that can be done through a catalog. I, I don't think that concept goes away. I, I don't think it's outdated. I think there could be other ways, but I, I do think it's something a lot of business people kind of can, can get their brains around easily. Um, but yeah, that's my thought. And what is your opinion on late binding approach for data warehouse build out? Um, yeah, I would think that kind of gets back to your, your ETL, your ELT. Um, I mean, I think with some of these data warehouse platforms, the idea of kind of loading it all up there is not a bad idea. And then kind of deciding as you want to use it, how it should be modeled, how it should be transformed. I, I do think is a trend that has a lot of validity to it. Um, is you, you don't know everything. I think, and again, in a traditional data warehouse, there sort of is that design build mentality and you can kind of load the data, and the, but you'll still have that 
idea that you before you load the data, you should know how it's be transformed. But I think in this more analytic world, it is more of discovery. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and kind of have that platform where it's more raw, and then you can kind of decide schema on a reader and how you want to transform that later. And those new platforms let you do that fairly nicely because that, that's that kind of the guy with the jeans and the, and the suit. Um, you can kind of do both. I love it. Well, Donna, this brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and hanging out with us today in this crazy world. Uh, just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the sessions. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day and stay safe out there. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Shannon. Bye.